three fundamental regulations that govern our federal awards. The Federal Grant and Cooperative Agreement Act of 1977, and we've included the USC citation so you can run home after this workshop and look it up. It actually is a fairly interesting law to read because it's actually written in normal English and it's about four paragraphs long. That's it. But it covers a lot of stuff. It, it explains the difference between a grant, a cooperative agreement, and a contract from the government's perspective, okay, when it issues those types of transactions. It explain, and this is mostly an instruction to federal officials on when they're supposed to use a grant financial assistance document versus a procurement or contract document. It's right in there in this regulation. Uh, how many people here are familiar with the concept that universities and nonprofits normally get title to equipment when they purchase it off of a federal award? Right. I mean, that's, that's fairly common knowledge. Well, it's not true. That's an exception to federal policy. Federal policy is the federal government owns anything purchased with federal funds. The exception is written into the Federal Grant and Cooperative Agreement Act for nonprofits and educational institutions, granting federal agencies the right to give title to nonprofits. But federal policy is that it, it all vests in the government. And that's how the, FAR, the Federal Acquisition Regulation for contracts comes out, default, because that's federal policy. And that's where the exception is. And then that exception, that's the law, the exception is rolled into or, or if you will, promulgated through all the various federal agencies' grant regulations. So the next one, uh, the Federal Acquisition Regulation, I just mentioned that. That's the entirety of 48 Code of, uh, um, Title 48 of the CFR, of the Code of Federal Regulations. The government's rules for buying things. That's basically, it's a policy and procedure manual for, or I should say a procedure manual for buying things. Uh, cost accounting standards. These do apply to universities to greater or lesser extent depending on the level of federal funding that you receive annually as an institution. Um, they, they apply to everybody, but they apply, there are parts that apply once you reach a higher threshold. Um, it's not something the average person personally has to worry about. It, it's handled through the costing and finance part of the institution as part of the indirect, uh, the F&A rate negotiation and the working with the federal government on that at that level. But I guess that there, there are things that come from the cost accounting standards that affect all of us, even, even though we don't spend, most of us don't spend a whole lot of time reading and suffering over them. But issues like um, whether you're going to direct charge clerical and administrative salaries um, as a direct cost to uh, grant or contract, what, one of the things that complicates those issues is because the cost accounting standards, um, it's all about consistency. Um, you want to have consistency between how you budget and how you accumulate costs. You want to have consistency between whether you are charging something as a direct cost or as an indirect cost. Um, and they, they provide illustrations of exceptions when things can sometimes be charged either as a direct or as an indirect cost, but there needs to be a policy basis for it. And in, in, in the absence of that, you're supposed to be um, accumulating these costs in, in a consistent way. So something is supposed to be either direct or indirect, and, and all of us deal with those issues. Can this um, office supply or these telecommunication costs or can these administrative salaries be charged as a direct cost in this particular case, even though normally they're covered in indirect costs. That challenge is an outgrowth of the consistency requirement that come out of the cost accounting standards. 